let me welcome you to today's forum and to the celebration of the Nicholas Institute's 10th anniversary. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Tim Perfetta. Um, I am the Institute's director, and I thank you for all joining us today. You know, about 10 years ago, in about an utterly transformed Cameron Indoor Stadium just across the street, a slightly younger version of myself described the auda audacious ambition for the new found, newly founded Nicholas Institute. At that event, I challenged the Institute to be not just another player in the game, but rather an organization committed to doing something fundamentally different, changing the game. And in particular, in those sessions, we envisioned that we would not just talk about problems here, we'd try and solve them. And with the support of Duke, with the counsel of our wonderful board of advisors, with the deep knowledge of our faculty colleagues, with the creative energy of Duke students, and with the skills and talents of our tremendous staff, I believe we were create, we've created an institute that is successfully try, taking on that challenge. In saying this, I want to honor at the outset one person that was instrumental in our founding, but is no longer with us. Our first Oceans Director, Rafe Sagarin, exhibited precisely the type of free and ambitious thinking that allowed us to find success. Rafe was the sort of creative and interdisciplinary mind that had the gall to think that the Homeland Security Department could learn from the resilience of biological systems and wrote on that. Rafe was tragically taken from us this year and taken from his wife and children by a drunk driver. I want to mention him so we never forget him and his contributions I want to ask all of you to look up his work and find a way to let his creativity live on. But thanks to Rafe and to many others, we have built an institute and an approach here at Duke that brings the best of critical thinking to the table to solve environmental challenges. The key to our success, if I were to narrow it down to one concept, I would use one of my favorite sports metaphors. Hockey great Wayne Gretzky once said, a good hockey player plays where the puck is, a great hockey player plays where the puck is going to be. At the Institute, I think our success is premised on our ability to skate to where that puck's going to be. Let me draw two illustrative examples from our first decade. First, we are now helping the United States decide how to use its federal lands in ways that maximize the benefits those natural systems bring to humans. Things like flood protection, recreational values, keeping our water clean, these values are not always on the table in our decision making, but we saw that the country needed to better understand them in the decisions they make about the public lands. We thus began working with faculty colleagues on this campus years ago to assess the research and tools needed to implement that mission. That group, the Ecosystem Services Working Group, has established Duke as a leader in this field. In the end, my colleague Lydia Olander was asked to create a national Ecosystem Services Partnership headquartered here and develop a guidebook for the federal government on how to incorporate the benefits from ecosystems into their decisions. The guidebook underpinned the newly released under policy guidance from the White House directing federal agencies to begin incorporating these values in the federal planning and decision making. Second example of our ability to skate to where the puck will lie is our work on the climate regulations under the Clean Air Act. In 2009, when many of us were watching the legislative efforts to address climate change go downhill, we realized as an organization that regulation of the Clean Air Act was an inevitable next step. But no one knew what that was going to look like. So we did what the Institute did, does so well. We convened the experts, including many of our faculty colleagues and many stakeholders, to ask how the Clean Air Act would work in this instance. That effort has led to five years of research and engagement, direct collaboration with over 20 states to aid in the design of their greenhouse gas rules, and economic research that provides policymakers with the tools to assess trade-offs inherent in the program. So when the President released his Clean Power Plan in August in the White House, it incorporated many policy concepts the Institute penned after deep consultation with state leaders, all proposals that will make the plan more flexible, more efficient, and more likely to succeed. But while it's fair to reflect on our successes, today is really about looking forward to our next challenges. Today we must talk about where the puck is going to be over the next 10 years, how to make sure the Institute is there for it. And the game, to keep my metaphor going, is not only changing, it's moving faster. 
What that means is we need to evolve to be even more nimble, more responsive, more prescient. Evidence of the world's quickening pace is all around us. For example, our ability to acquire information about environmental challenges is expanding exponentially. New technologies have democratized the process of data gathering. Smartphones alone are creating a technological revolution in terms of the acquisition of data. This is global. In Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, there are predicted to be almost a billion smartphone users by 2019. Our world is also becoming much more urban, changing and intensifying our sustainability challenges. At the beginning of the 20th century, only 13% of the world's population lived in urban areas. According to UN estimates, over 60% of the developing world's population will be found in urban areas in 2030. Hundreds of new and bigger cities throughout the world can mean increasing in demands for water, for power, and an ever-decreasing connection between those populations and the natural world among them. Technology continues to outpace our ability to create policies to address it. Back in 2005, when we were in Cameron Indoor Stadium, who would have seen the role hydraulic fraction would play in our energy economy? But now we need to bend our legal infrastructure to control impact from this fast-moving technology. And looking seaward, as our global fisheries falter, aquaculture is expanding and impacting the stewardship of our oceans at an equally fast pace. In 2005, only one in three fish on our plates were farm-raised. It is estimated to be two in three by 2030. Already we face the environmental challenges, environmental challenges from aquaculture, water pollution, fish diseases. So as the world moves to a, a world of 9.6 billion people, we have to understand how we can simultaneously expand aquaculture to allow us to provide food for the people, but improve its environmental performance. So today, we seek answers on how we can, can, can continue in this rapidly changing world to meet Duke's ambitious call to serve society by sustaining a healthy environment. How do we maintain our leadership when the questions come even faster? How does this university bring its depth and its entrepreneurship to these emerging critical questions? And in doing so, we need to prove useful information to leaders in public policy, in business, in nonprofit organizations, so that they can solve the problems that emerge more quickly than ever. And we need to connect this information needs to the processes that generate the knowledge that fill them, the computer, the desk, the lab bench of our research colleagues, so they can orient their research quickly towards critical and emerging environmental problems. And we need to bring this understanding of the issues to the tremendously talented students around us, the graduates of Duke, so they can become the leaders to solve these problems across the country and the globe once they leave our campus. Today, we will look at the emerging environmental questions in the context of particular challenges. How do we use this incredible surge of energy and environmental data in our policies? How can impact investment respond to challenges of ocean stewardship? How does our power sector evolve to the technological changes that are disrupting its business model? And we'll ask some of our peers how they best stay ahead of the pace of change, hoping to find collaboration in answering these challenges with them. All in all, this forum should be a lively and exciting day of exploration, an exploration for the next decade of the Institute and really the next decade of the world. I hope today that we can begin to identify the issues ahead and how we stay ahead of them. And in doing so, I hope we can be audacious enough to inspire others around campus to replicate these efforts in institutions focused on other societal problems. And I hope we can be audacious enough to make our model open source, inspire colleagues, at other universities and other institutions to replicate our successes as well. We've done well for 10 years at the Nicholson Institute, and I'm proud of our work. I'm proud of our staff, our donors, our faculty, our partners, our board members, and our students. Thank you for being here today to help celebrate our successes and to be ready to, and ready ourselves for the decade ahead. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to welcome uh, to, the, to the podium President Broadhead. We're really thrilled and grateful to have President Broadhead opening today's event because it's really his vision of putting the university's intellectual power into the service of society that engendered the institute and has sustained it for a decade. President Broadhead is a scholar of literature and has effectively drawn attention to the need for a broad humanistic approach to unlock the full potential of education and enable productivity, fulfillment, and happiness. 
So this might, at first glance, appear to be, not, if not contrary to, at least benignly un unconnected to, his support for a policy institute like this. But in fact, it's a common piece. Whether through literature or medicine or economics, the university has a unique role in playing, to play in advancing the common good. And to play that role, it must be connected every day to consequential decisions around it. I am proud of President Broadhead's commitment to the Institute, and today I'm proud to welcome to the stage. Thank you. Well, I like going to 10th birthday parties very much. Uh, and I might even say I can remember the birth of the Nicholas Institute. Uh, I remember it well because I was named the incoming president of this university in December 2003. And in January of 2004, under Pete Nicholas's leadership, uh, a vision was laid out about the development of how the Nicholas School uh, could, could take on, uh, could, could develop a kind of parallel partner uh, agency that would have a somewhat different mission. And I remember its name, the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. Uh, the point of this is, it's not just policy because it's also academic. It will draw on the strengths that you can really only find in universities where people pursue projects for long periods of time driven by curiosity curiosity more than immediate practical payoffs. But it isn't just academic because it also is linked to policy. It's about taking research and bringing it uh, to the place where it can have application. And then there was this magical word uh, that was kind of risky and thrilling to us all, the word solutions. Uh, you know, academics like to think about questions. They like to think about problems. Uh, uh, but the notion that uh, the reason to think about the problem would be that someday one might solve it, uh, whoa, that's a, I never thought about that before. Uh, and so a new, ki a new kind of entity came into being. Uh, I remember that. I'm happy to see Pete in the front row. Uh, I got, so it, it, it fell to the early days of the young President Broadhead uh, to try to make this thing happen. I remember Bill Riley coming. Uh, I remember spending several days with you in the January of that winter uh, thinking about this project, uh, uh, seeing your vision. You and I had known each other at another university, and it was fun for me to see you recognize the special assets of this place uh, for a project such, such as we had. Uh, you helped us assemble the board. I, I see so many of them here, past, present, uh, and future. That was a great help. And then we had to hire a director of it. Uh, and there was this person, Tim Profeta, uh, who was quite well known in environmental circles. He was, I believe, the council, uh, uh, he, he worked on the staff of Senator Joe Lieberman. Uh, and he had been the principal architect of, I never can remember which name came first. I think it was called the Lieberman-McCain Climate Stewardship Act of 2003. Is that right? OK. Now, when I mentioned these data, is that right? Thank you. I studied it. Uh, <laughs> When I mention these data, on the one hand, it seems just the other day. But on the other hand, the very facts I've mentioned make you realize how much things have changed since then. Uh, even to mention uh, the Lieberman-McCain Climate Stewardship Act, uh, guess what? That was a time when there were bipartisan efforts. Uh, that was a time. <laughs> Right? That was a time uh, when bipartisan people ag agreed that the climate was something that would need stewardship. And that was, something, that was a time when it seemed that there might be a federal legislative s solution or way of advancing, not to mention the fact that the bill was based on cap and trade, uh, a notion that became unspeakable uh, to some uh, parties to that as, as time advanced. Uh, so let's just say, in the 10 short years that the Nicholas Institute has existed, I think one of the most interesting facts about it is the underlying problem uh, of, cli of climate and environment has grown more grave, uh, but the solution to it has grown somewhat less obvious, or at least more decentralized, or at least maybe one might say one has to be more imaginative about where you're going to achieve the solution and what array of different partners working together might be necessary to, uh, to achieve it. Uh, and I do feel, as I look back on the accomplishment of the, of the Institute, uh, uh, se several things. One, the way it really has worked in partnership with the academic functions of the university, while also a little bit shifting the way of doing business of the regular university. Um, uh, uh, scholarly people are used to working over long periods of meditational time uh, to publish works deeply influential to the people who read the small, the, the small readership of the publications we publish in. Um, so it involved getting people to do work as powerful as academic work, but having it be on a shorter timetable and focused toward a larger audience. Um, it had to do then with 
uh, building communities of other partners, non-academic partners. Uh, these would be sometimes people from states, sometimes from, sometimes from industry, sometimes from NGOs, uh, to form groups that could try to get leverage on, uh, uh, on, on problems. And then it had to do with just a willingness to understand that every year you can say, this year I'm phrasing the question this way, but the way the question needs to be phrased is itself continually evolving under you as you go forward with the project. Um, I've loved the fact uh, I never saw Nicholas Institute spend one day, let alone one year, in grief for the fact that what looked like the original ways that this nation would get leverage on these issues went away. When you saw that go away, you started thinking about, so where are we now and where might we be in the future? And when I went to visit with your um, uh, wonderful colleagues about two weeks ago, uh, what kind of things are they working on? Um, well, if the uh, uh, Congress isn't the solution, the states know they have to be a solution. They have to be ready to do something, and so that you are out there readying them, uh, helping them work together to figure out what kind of shared approaches can they have. Um, all the ecosystem work that's always been part of this institute, uh, now finding a new part thinking specifically about mangrove swamps, the sort of coastline features, uh, uh, rapidly eroding uh, that have been especially uh, powerful in their ability to, uh, to, to store or sequester uh, carbon. Uh, the very exciting work I heard about water and water rights, uh, uh, which is certainly going to be uh, uh, an ever-growing issue for us. Uh, so I just would have to say, I use, uh, I'm going to use a word to praise this institute, uh, and, and it's a word that can be misused, so make sure you hear it in just the right way. I love the opportunism of this institute. Uh, I love the fact uh, that it's, it's, it's always having to be in the moment of inquiry and figure out, so what can we do there? Who could we work with at that point? Uh, and then the next day, it's another new opportunity has to be scoped out, uh, and on you go from there. I just want to say, uh, as president of this university, I am grateful to the board, uh, to the staff, uh, to all the colleagues. I see Alan Townsend, your colleagues in the Nicholas School, colleagues in uh, 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 Fuqua, colleagues in uh, 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 Sanford School of Public Policy, uh, everybody who's helped make, make this thing work, and to the partners from other uh, uh, entities represented in this room. But I'm just going to close with this. Uh, we, uh, uh, Tim talked a little bit about what the Nicholas Institute has done to the world of environmental issues and environmental policy solutions. I'm going to end by saying, uh, in, the idea, in the eyes of the president, there has been a very consequential uh, 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 effect of NEEPS that is perhaps not known to people who aren't Dukies, which is NEEPS was, the, was, I think you could argue, the first thing that gave us an idea of what eventually became a kind of signature of this university. Uh, the idea, we've spent the last 10 years devising programs that, that follow the shape of uh, Nicholas Institute uh, in uh, saying, we're going to start with problems and not with disciplines. Uh, when you start with a problem, you're then going to want to figure out how to broker relations among all the disciplines you need to work together toward a solution. We're going to have our work be uh, 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 accomplished partly within universities and partly outside uh, and getting enough outside to understand um, what a problem looks like when it's not presented in its academic phase uh, and organized uh, toward making the university an engine of problem solving. Uh, it was in 2005 that we had the birthday of uh, the Nicholas Institute. In 2006, we had the birthday of the uh, Duke Global Health Institute, which we could argue is, uh, 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 has much the same ambition and the same kind of signature uh, that, that, that this uh, uh, institute has had, but in the field uh, of health. You know perhaps about the creation of the program Duke Engage. 3,000 Duke undergraduates have now gone out of the university into some place where there is some fundamental human challenge and tried to learn how they could use the things they'd studied in classes to achieve solutions that are not homework solutions but real world solutions uh, and to think of themselves, as, to learn to think of themselves as problem solvers or the value of their intelligence to be in uh, uh, the, the way they can bring it to the deep needs of the world. Uh, the creation uh, two or three years ago of the Bass Connections program. This is, I believe, the only university that in addition to its disciplinary programmatic curriculum has a problem-based curriculum where in every school people can come and take courses on energy, take courses on health, take courses on information, other such things, uh, and if they're bitten by the bug, step into the world uh, of, of trying to work with teams of academics and non-academics to achieve solutions to real-world problems. 
Um, uh, an archaeologist studying all this would say, ah, but didn't it all start with the Nicholas Institute of Environmental Solid Policy Solutions uh, and with the vision that was projected in the early uh, 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 winter and early spring of 2004? Uh, tenth birthday, uh, when you're 10 years old, you're pretty old, uh, in your own eyes at least, uh, uh, and I would say you're certainly not an infant anymore. Uh, on the other hand, by your 10th birthday, you haven't had your bar mitzvah yet. Uh, <laughs> by your 10th birthday, you can't get your driver's license yet, uh, and you can't vote yet, and there's many other things. Uh, so I'd have to say I look forward, uh, I, I, I embrace this occasion as a chance to look forward to the continued evolution and maturation uh, of this institute, uh, and the ever fuller way it will leave up to the power of the original dream. Congratulations and thanks. Thank you, President Broadhead. Uh, I, you know, in, in the um, USA in 2003, the world called that bill the McCain-Lieberman bill. The Lieberman office called it the Lieberman-McCain bill. And, uh, Wikipedia calls it the Lieberman. Yeah, well, there you go. I'm sure you wrote the Yes. <laughs> so we won, I guess. Um, it's now my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Provost Sally Kornbluth uh, to the podium. Uh, Sally has been the provost for only a little more than a year, but has really already started to put her fingerprints on, on the university at large and the institutes uh, uh, quite dramatically. Uh, although she's been only the provost for a year, she's been a member of Duke's faculty since 1994 and is really a, a true uh, citizen and product of Duke University. Uh, Sally has two decades of distinguished research, teaching, and administration at the university and really was a clear choice to serve as Duke's next provost because she's proven to be an innovator and problem solver in two different dimensions, in raising the bar for academic excellence at the campus and also in making a difference in the world. It's these sort of cultures of Duke that, um, that, that the president already referred to that was so clear in, in Sally's career as well. I've been grateful to, to, pro, to Sally's acuity in making connections between the Nicholas Institute and many of the schools, peer institutes, and programs that, that, that President Broad referred to. Interdisciplinary initiatives such as Bass Connections, you know, a problem-based curriculum is a good match for the Nicholas Institute because we source problems well and uh, hopefully solutions in the end. And her, her continuous scanning you know, the campus to, for our ability to allow faculty and graduate students to have an impact in the public sphere. I've really been so appreciative of Sally's support since she's come to, to be the provost, and I really appreciate your willingness to help us open this today. Thank you, Sal. Thanks. I have to say I never thought of this as the event on the way to the bar mitzvah of the Nicholas <laughs> Institute, but nonetheless. Um, in any case, I'm really pleased to be here with you all today to kick off uh, this important event, and I want to thank Tim for the invitation, and I appreciate Tim uh, and Dick's opening remarks to prepare everyone for the, the day ahead. So as you know, the wider occasion for today's event is to celebrate all of the uh, things that the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solution um, has achieved since its inception 10 years ago here at Duke. I think it's especially fitting that the Institute has chosen to honor its decade of work by convening a set of robust and forward-thinking conversation around today's environmental challenges and the best way to get to solutions. As you've heard um, and you've seen uh, in your agenda, uh, the agenda is designed to help us take a, a deeper look at the rapid pace of change in the world and at the challenges that such changes create for environmental policy and how some of those change agents can be harnessed to help identify solutions. So uh, let me use a sort of time-honored device in these kind of uh, introductions and take you back a decade just for a moment. Um, so 10 years, uh, it's a long or a short time depending on your perspective, I guess. But uh, let's start very lightly and look at pop culture of a decade ago. Um, a Star Wars movie was released that year, and uh, well, I guess that doesn't actually help us very much in grounding <laughs> um, in the time frame. But in any event, how about this? Uh, in 2005, Blockbuster Video was still going strong. Netflix was just a DVD by mail service. And if you can believe it, that was the time the first YouTube up, uh, video was uploaded. So that'll give you a little bit of context. But um, it does offer some, uh, pre some information on how rapidly ch uh, technologies can change the world and take hold. But let's uh, take a little bit of a more serious context and look at a few points of leadership around the world. 
Ten years ago, Pope John Paul II died. George Bush started his second term as U.S. President. Uh, Angela Merkel became the Chancellor of Germany. Sandra Day O'Connor announced her retirement from the Supreme Court. And William Rehnquist passed, passed away. Now let's look at a few of the significant environmental crises events from a decade ago. There were a record 27 named storms in 2005. Hurricane Katrina was among them, and an earthquake in Kashmir claimed the lives of over 80,000 people and had a dev devastating environmental impact. The Indian Ocean tsunami killed almost a quarter of a million people and contaminated farms, forests, fishing stocks, and drinking water. Uh, let's look at one item of climate policy from that year. The 10th annual UN Climate Change Conference was held in Montreal in 2005, and out of that, the Kyoto Protocol went into effect. The Kyoto Treaty, in a nutshell, acknowledges that humans are causing climate change by emitting greenhouse gases and calls for state parties to reduce those greenhouse gases. Our then-President Bush opposed it, but it went forward without U.S. support. In 2005, the world population was 6.45 billion strong, and today it's estimated at 7.3 billion and growing. And the challenges facing us in the area of water, oceans, and climate and energy and sustainable, sustainability excuse me, are on the rise. So looking back, I would say that 2005 was a very good year to launch an institute around environmental policy solutions. So Dick spoke of how NEEPS has brought Duke into the service of society. I'd like to reflect on some of the ways that the institute has been able to bring these insights acquired in the mission back to the research and teaching missions of the university. Some obvious examples are the wealth of research and publications available to Duke faculty in the area of ecosystem services since the formation of the Nicholas Institute faculty working group in that area uh, four years ago. Put it simply, as the world population continues to grow, more resources are needed to provide food, water, and other necessities. Co-led by Lydia Olander and the Nicholas School's Dean Urban, the working group integrates the collective expertise of Duke faculty, staff, and students across the, the university to address such important issues. So I mentioned a transition in the Vatican leadership earlier. That transition ultimately led to the current pope, pope who is proving to be rather revolutionary on a number of fronts, including the environment. In May, Pope Francis issued a unique papal encyclical that was dedicated to environmental and climate issues. The Nicholas Institute partnered with the Keenan Institute for Ethics, the Duke Divinity and Law Schools, and the Sanford School of Public Policy to support a number of conversations focused on the implications of the encyclical. Nicholas Institute leaders Brian Murray and Jonas Monest work with other Duke faculty to bring economic and legal perspectives to these questions. I understand that a Nicholas Institute paper and other workshops responding to the Pope's environmental ministry are in the works. On the teaching side, the Nicholas Institute, as we've heard, has made important contributions uh, to things like Bass Connection projects teams in the energy theme. Institute faculty and senior staff have taught norm numerous courses. And the Institute provides a number of opportunities for both undergraduates and graduate students to engage with today's pressing environmental issues, including assistantship opportunities and a doctoral scholars program. One great illustration of the Institute's engagement with teaching is the recent decision to create a topically oriented class in the Nicholas School to, set, uh, to run this spring with Professor Lori Benier that will cover the myriad of issues spinning out of the Nicholas Institute's focus on President Obama's Clean Power Plan. And of course, in the arena of providing information that informs policymakers, the Institute's wealth of experience over this past decade provides valuable lessons for a host of arenas across the campus, including policy labs envisioned in Sanford and our new health policy center that uh, came out in the news just this week and I think will be a, a great collaborator uh, for the Nicholas Institute. So big data, sustainability, leadership, innovation, technologies, today's agenda is really focused on the challenges and opportunities for finding solutions. With significant leaders around the world and in this nation acknowledging the urgency of the environmental challenges that face us, the work of the Nicholas Institute is, if anything, more important than ever. So I join you all in looking forward to seeing future outcomes of Nicholas Institute's collaborations with its partners across campus, such as the Nicholas School, the Energy Initiative, the Sanford School, and more. I look forward to seeing how the Institute can engage even more with Duke faculty as we continue to bolster our intellectual communities of scholars and our excellence in faculty leaders. You know, today would not have been possible without, obviously, without the, the decade leading up to it. And that decade um, of work that we've seen in the Nicholas Institute would not have been possible without the advisory board members who've done so much to guide and support 
uh, the institute, especially uh, the namesake, the institute's namesake, Pete Nicholas, and the board's chairman, uh, Bill Riley. So I look forward to hearing from Bill in just a moment, but I'd like to say two more things in, in closing before I turn, over, uh, turn things over to him. First, a quote from our Duke University mission statement, which I'm sure you all have read very carefully. Um, Duke University seeks to engage the mind, elevate the spirit, and stimulate the best effort of all who are associated with the university to contribute in diverse ways to the local community, the state, the nation, and the world, and to attain and maintain a place of leadership in all that we do. Uh, those are not just words, they're really guiding principles for the university. They're something that we strive to embody in our work every day, and I hope all of you um, experience today's talks, information sharing, and network, uh, networking as vehicles that help really bring this mission to life. Uh, and I guess lastly, I would say a happy birthday to, happy 10th birthday to the Nicholas Institute, so thanks. Thank you, Sally, very much for those nice, those very kind remarks. Um, now it is my pleasure to welcome our chairman of the board, Bill Riley, to the podium. Uh, it's really not just a passing compliment to say that Bill Riley has been involved in every success that the Nicholas Institute can claim. And to me, it's really a matter of, of historical record. Um, Bill was named chairman of the Nicholas Institute Board of Advisors at its inception and served with constant enthusiasm for the last 10 years and helped me and really led in recruiting a truly eminent board that crosses business, government, civil society, and brings expertise and network to every area of environmental concern. Bill is really a truly an environmental statesman. He has worked on these challenges from every perspective, from the nonprofit leader to being the administrator of EPA to leading the Deepwater Commission recently and to his role at Texas Pacific Group. Bill really sees these perspectives from every these issues from every perspective. And his broad approach to environmental problem solving based on that experience has deeply ingrained at the Institute in everything we do. Bill has taught us to be evidence-based, to be nonpartisan, to address complex challenges and ask, drawing on the best resources from academia, how close can we get to a, quote, right answer here? Not shoehorning a preconceived agenda into this problem, nor to lean towards the most politically palatable result and way forward. So a happy birthday to the Nicholson Institute is a hard, a happy 10th birthday to, to Bill and his leadership of us. And I'd just like to thank Bill again, once again, for all you've done to bring us here today. Bill. Thank you, Tim. One cannot sit here and listen to what we have just heard without realizing that there is a perfect coincidence between the mind and the heart of the president of this university and the provost, without whom we really would not celebrate the success that we celebrate today. And I want to pay tribute to the founder's idea, to Pete Nicholas, to the president to whom this became a very important, I think even emblematic, representation of his vision for putting the university to the service of society. For the provost, Sally, and your predecessor, who were very important at every step of the way, to helping the institute do what it had to do, which is to find its place within the university, to demonstrate its usefulness and friendship, support for other aspects of activities at the university to become a partner with the other schools, with the Nicholas School, of course, of which it's a part, the Sanford School of Public Policy, the Business School, Fuqua. And that has happened, and it's happened in very large measure because of the tremendous support, visible, specific support. Do you believe he knew so much about this organization? I mean, I was surprised. <laughs> Presidents have a lot to do. You obviously have been deeply interested, not just in the institute as a part of the apparatus of the university, but the issues that it's taken on. And the issues that an institute like this does take on, some of which are obvious, not all, pose themselves a number of questions. How do you deploy a relatively small organization looking at the full gamut of challenges that we have with respect to the environment, climate, 
food policy, ecosystems degradation, fisheries, the whole range of them, and ensure that your contribution is significant and effective, offers solutions to whichever you decide to take on. That choice largely has been that of its director, Tim Perfetta. He has been enormously helped by Tanya Voich, who has been involved importantly in the energy work, energy climate that the Institute has done, particularly in Africa. And the staff that he has put together uh, is really first rate. I fell to calling um, one of our recruits, the Alex Rodriguez of um, his field in environmental economics, and, and I can't look at Brian Murray without remembering that now, apologizing for it to some degree, Brian. <laughs> but I, and I was saying I, I saw him at Yankee Stadium strike out the other night with the bases loaded. But uh, that's, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> but it, it is a tremendous achievement for the Institute to have kept Tim Perfetta for 10 years through uh, quite a number of other opportunities, which I'm aware of. Um, he's a hot property, and um, he has served us so well. I'm grateful also to the members of the board who have uh, been very dedicated and brought specific expertise, associations, connections, help in their own areas of responsibility. We had a moment, Dick Broadhead and I, before we convened, we talked about the event 10 years ago when the Institute was launched. And a couple of things stand out from that. A splendid speech by Jared Diamond, uh, very broad gauged, as you would imagine Jared would do. And um, I I'll recall also Russell Train delivered the keynote that day. My mentor, my most admired figure in field of whom I have later succeeded, I think, to four or even five jobs that Russ had previously held. And um, Russ uh, told a story that I had never heard before of um, meeting with President Nixon to present the environmental program to him, developed by the Council on Environmental Quality, of which I was a staff member. And uh, Nixon reading the description of the National Land Use Policy Act, which I had written, and um, Nixon responding only to that particular description by asking, who is the son of a bitch who wrote this? <laughs> Funny what you remember. <laughs> well, I was 30 years old, and, and my boss was uh, too kind to tell me what the president thought of my work. Um, my bill didn't pass either, Tim. <laughs> it uh, twice passed the Senate and missed by one vote in the House. The other thing that I recall from that day, and we were discussing, is that we commissioned some polling data. And the question was, what is the attitude of the American public on the environment? And where is their sense, or is there a sense of urgency about acting on the environment? And what the polling data indicated was the American people essentially thought that most of our environmental problems had been resolved. We had pretty good environment. And secondly, that environmental initiatives cost jobs. Those were the two. And I'm reminded that polling data now indicates a strong predominance of opinion that the climate is changing and that humans are contributing to that change. But I never speak to a member of Congress who reports that he or she was asked on the stump about climate or encouraged to develop legislation to address it. So in some respects, the culture is there, but the politics are not. And it strikes me that at the moment, the EPA administrator and EPA, Gina McCarthy, have the extremely uncomfortable responsibility now of developing a rule, the clean carbon rule, which I'm sure we will discuss today, which uh, the majority of the Congress believes addresses a problem that does not exist. Now, that's really anomalous, and I can't recall a time, Bill, uh, when that has been true with respect to such a consequential piece of legislation. Through that, as, as Dick pointed out, 
the Institute has continued to drive on climate, has studied the economics of cap and trade, uh, how practically such programs ought to work. And this has been a continuing preoccupation, especially of, of Tim. But they have also done extraordinarily effective work with the Environmental Defense Fund on training and informing the fisheries councils about fish stocks and their implications for take limitations, on ecosystem services, which I dare say when we first began to talk about this, and I've never particularly liked the term, but we haven't thought of anything better, um, was unappreciated. I mean, in a sense, it's logical that, that we all recognize that nature is important in healthy ecosystems to watersheds and all sorts of other such things, but as a matter of policy, to get the government to consider it, which a decision has now been made at the Office of Management and Budget to include ecosystem services in the analysis of projects and expenditures, which is a great breakthrough. And this is just one more instance where this institute can share the credit for a very important national policy advance. Well, there are several others, and they were described here today, that um, have given this record one that is exemplary and I think unique to any institute concerned with the environment, any school of the environment, in any university I'm familiar with. I've had experience with, uh, with Yale and the corporation and I taught there one year and with Stanford where I taught for a year after I left government. I am not aware of a university which is more effective at ensuring that the various expertise of different organizations, institutes, and scholars is shared collaboratively with others on the campus. I think this is a mark of great distinction and success on the part of Duke and has been very strongly encouraged and developed by Dick Broadhead. So we have a lot to be grateful for and to admire today. And um, I know that we're going to look at some of the pressing issues of the day. Uh, big data is uh, one of them that uh, we get to, I think, shortly. The role of NGOs and leadership in NGOs. And NGOs have come to the fore in so many ways. I'm reminded as the White House uh, presses on Tim and the Institute and some others of us to engage certain issues to give lend kind of outside credibility most recently in connection with the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the environmental provisions of it, which I'm sure that uh, I will ask Carter Roberts, who has strongly supported it, President of World Wildlife Fund, to address when we interview him later this afternoon. It promises to be a rich day. It's been well thought through in terms of the key question, which is, after all, leadership, and this institute has provided it. And in the sense that the Congress has been a less than friendly recipient of some of our best ideas, at least for the moment, I would remind you of a remark, a writing that Daniel Patrick Moynihan authored many years ago. And he said, if I've learned anything in 40 years of government, it is the, that the central conservative idea is that it is culture and not politics that determines the success of a society, but that politics can change a culture, can save it from itself, and the result of the two is that we are a better society for their integration. I think we're in a moment where the culture is ahead of the politics in the country, it's our job to continue to prepare practical ideas for solutions when the moment is ripe, and the moment has been ripe at the state and local level on climate and so many other issues that we've addressed. And it's very much the vision of Tim Profeta that has seen that, has explored that, and continues to look for opportunities to make a contribution. Thank you.